Okay, um, everyone settle down. So good afternoon, everyone. So today we welcome Charles Shears again for a second lecture in our Steambox um, lecture. And today Charles is going to talk about the technology behind the exciting work he presented yesterday. Uh, I don't have to introduce Charles a second time, but uh, we all know him really well from the software package Reliant that we use a lot in our cryo EM processing. And I, I'm sure he will present a lot of stunning work going on in today's lecture. So without further ado, please welcome Charles for his second lecture. Thank you. Thanks, CJ. Yeah, so today I thought that I'd speak about some of the uh, software developments that have uh, happened in uh, RelyOn and kind of give an overview of what has happened to the field in, 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 uh, in recent years, kind of why everybody wants to do uh, CryM uh, nowadays. So I thought that starts with, with this picture, which was taken uh, on our Polara microscope, these are uh, this is purified solution of ribosomes from the Ramakrishnan lab, and you know for those who aren't that familiar with CryM, we've put a small drop of a purified protein solution on an experimental grid. We then take away excess liquid with uh, with a piece of tissue paper, basically, and then rapidly freeze it into liquid ethane, and hopefully uh, in, a, in a carbon support film with, with punched holes in it, which are about one or two microns in diameter, the kind of surface tension of the water will kind of have spanned a very thin film of, of uh, solution in which these ribosomes were tumbling around in random orientations, which then get frozen so rapidly in liquid ethane that the ice doesn't have time to, to the water doesn't have time to crystallize into uh, hexagonal ice, but you get this vitreous uh, uh, solid state of, of water, uh, which then um, uh, does not diffract in the electron microscope, so we can do trans transmission electron microscopy imaging. So each of the uh, rather grainy little uh, black dots here now is a two-dimensional projection image of the uh, scattering potential of the molecule, the Coulomb potential of, uh, of, the, of the macromolecular uh, complex of, of interest. And you know you, you have many of them in, in each uh, field of view. <coughs> now, to, what we now want to do is we want to calculate a three-dimensional reconstruction of this uh, scattering potential uh, of, the, of the object. And uh, in first instance, we're going to assume that all of these ribosomes are in an identical structural state. And all that matters is they're in different uh, projection directions. Now, uh, three-dimensional reconstruction is, I think, best understood in the Fourier space. So if we have a three-dimensional uh, object, then, of course, we can take uh, in the computer, we can, we can uh, discretize this on a 3D grid, and we can take a discrete uh, Fourier transform, which is uh, uh, represented with this blobby thing here. That's just a mathematical operation. We can use standard libraries to go very quickly uh, back and forth. Uh, it's the same information expressed in a different way. Now, inside the electron microscope, what we have, and that's kind of a, um, depicted here with these these red arrows is the, kind of the electrons going through the three-dimensional object and then yielding a two-dimensional uh, projection image. Now the optics of the microscope isn't perfect, which gives rise to certain point spread functions, etc., which which I'll ignore here. For now, we're just going to assume it's it's a, just a normal two-dimensional projection. Now, a two-dimensional discrete image collected on, on, on a detector, for example, I could then do this a similar two-dimensional Fourier transform, then it can go again back, back and forward. Now, uh, there is this uh, projection slice theorem that I'm going to need to do to do three-dimensional reconstruction, which says that this two-dimensional transform is actually a central th section through the three-dimensional uh, transform of the, uh, of the original 3D object. And the orientation of the slice, it, it goes through the origin of the Fourier transform, and the orientation is orthogonal to the, uh, to the actual projection direction of the initial uh, image uh, being formed. So, sorry, well that's, let me go back. 
What that means is that if I can somehow orient all my two-dimensional projection images relative to, to a common three-dimensional framework, then what I will be doing, I'll be, I'll be sampling the 3D space with many differently oriented 2D slices, which slowly will fill up the entirety of, of 3D Fourier space, and then doing a three-dimensional reconstruction is nothing more than doing the inverse transform uh, in 3D, and I have my three-dimensional uh, reconstruction. So that then raises the question, you know, how do I get to know all the relative orientations of each of these individual 2D projection images? Um, when, I, when all I have is this collection of many, perhaps thousands of these grayish images with multiple copies of these molecules in it uh, to start from. So to explain that, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention the uh, projection matching algorithm. So <clears throat> let's assume we start with something that we have, with some three-dimensional estimate with a little bit of information about our uh, 3D reconstruction that we're after. And uh, the, the algorithms have now gotten so good that in practice you don't need to have even a low, low kind of resolution blobby impression of, of estimate of what, what the 3D reconstruction looks like. You can just start from a featureless spherical ball and the whole thing will, uh, still has quite good uh, convergence properties. Now what we'll do, we'll, we'll start from this initial three-dimensional guess and in the computer we're now going to generate what we call a, a, a reference projection library. So in all possible 3D orientations, I'm going to calculate line integrals along these uh, red arrows on the first slide and make uh, reference projections, top view, side views, front views, uh, etc. Everything as finely sampled as I think would be uh, necessary. Now, for each of the boxed out individual noisy images from that, that, that large micrograph image that I showed on, on the very first slide, um, we, we've, boxed, we've identified all the, all the particles and I'm now going to compare each of these little boxed out uh, particle images with all of the possible uh, reference projections and I'm going to choose which one uh, it resembles most. Now, resemble most is kind of an intuitive concept if all that the program does will be some calculation. So, for example, you can subtract one from the other and see when the difference between the reference projection and the actual experimental image is uh, the smallest. <laughs> And if I do that for all the now tens or hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of individual particle images, then you know some of them will be fit best as, as a top view and some as a front view and a side view. And besides doing all the different rotations, I could also, perhaps I, I didn't pick it exactly in the center, so I can also translate them up and down a bit and find all their exact centers. Doing that for all the hundreds of thousands of images then assigns a three-dimensional rotation and perhaps and, and, and an in-plane shift to each of these individual particles. And now I'm going to just you know, calculate their 2D Fourier transforms, put them all back in this three-dimensional Fourier space, do the inverse transform, and that then gives me a reconstruction of the uh, molecule that I'm after. Now, you can show mathematically that if you do this, you're guaranteed to, uh, to make the map better. So you will make an improvement starting from this map uh, going in uh, to this map. And that means that uh, you can now repeat the whole process. Because we started out with a relatively featureless thing. And in practice, I told you, you could even start from, from, from just a featureless uh, sphere. And that means that the initial orientations, the, all these relative orientations, translations, rotations are perhaps not so good yet and we've made some mistakes but uh, the, this map will be better than that map so we can iterate our way through and uh, this now gets ever ever better and will hopefully, and this now is not guaranteed, yield to the uh, best possible reconstruction from the uh, 2D uh, image data. So that's kind of uh, the basics of three-dimensional reconstruction from, from cryo-m images. 
Now, uh, my colleague at the LMB, Richard Henderson, already back in uh, 1995, promised that it would be uh, that you would be able to do this kind of analysis, uh, and then based on just physics of radiation damage, which is actually the limiting factor in all this. So the the first image was very gray, kind of featureless image and the main limitation is there that the electrons that I use for images will destroy the actual structure that I'm looking at through radiation damage so I'll get breakage of bonds and so on and then if you keep the beam on too long some of you I've seen you'll just evaporate the whole sample into the vacuum of, of your column so the physics of radiation damage is what kind of limits this we need to use very few electrons in order to prevent or at least reduce radiation damage to an extent that we can still have a structure to look at and reconstruct and it was Richard who kind of looked at this from a theoretical point of view and he said he made calculations and predicted you know for a hundred thousand Dalton uh, protein complex, you should be able to, uh, to, to do atomic resolution and by this Richard meant an, a reconstruction to enough detail in which you could then do de novo atomic modeling, so that's probably around three angstroms resolution. I'll speak to you about true atomic resolution a bit later on. And he would say, oh, you need approximately 10,000 particles. Now I joined the field of, of uh, cryo -M in uh, 2003 and, and, and worked for quite a while in, in Madrid and f during all those years people thought really Richard was quite the optimist because uh, the type of resolutions that people would get on complexes that were way bigger than 100 kilodaltons, you know, people would look at megadalton big ribosomes and get reconstructions, you know, in 2003, perhaps of 20 angstroms, and then it kind of slowly got better. And when I left, uh, uh, they were perhaps eight or, or eight or nine or so angstroms. But you know, there was ne nowhere near the novo atomic modeling for 100,000 dalton proteins from 10,000 particles images. And that then all changed quite suddenly in, in 2012, 2013, by what, what then people like Werner Kuhlbrand turned the, did a resolution revolution in, in cryo-electron microscopy. So just to illustrate this, uh, all these black points were 21st century structures, 2000 and 2010, I think. And this is molecular weight here in, in megadaltons and the type of resolutions that uh, that you would get uh, in the EM database, so the EMDB. And you can see as you go towards larger complexes, resolutions would, would improve and rather than just having blobs for domains, perhaps for some of the larger ones you could see alpha helices as, as kind of tubular densities which you need about nine angstroms for. And, um, but for example, separation of two beta sheets in a two beta strands in a beta sheet, as I told you yesterday, happens at 4.7 angstroms. You know, there would be very few uh, reconstructions in the EMDB where you could actually get to that level. So doing actual main tra chain tracing in an EMDB uh, map would be Im virtually impossible for, for many of the uh, proteins out there. And then in red are some of the structures that came out 2013, 2014 or so. So over a whole range of, of, of uh, sizes, you suddenly got to resolutions where you do see uh, clear main chain connectivity, clear side chains, etc., and people could build the Nova atomic models. <coughs> So what happened, what, what kind of underlied the, this resolution revolution? Uh, a very important part was uh, work actually also uh, driven by uh, Richard Henderson was development of uh, new electron detectors. So until then people would use uh, photographic film was the best uh, detector until then, but of course not very convenient. You had to kind of develop films and scan them and it was about intrinsically very uh, hard work and low throughput. And then people developed CCD detectors, which some people loved. You could automate them. You know, this is early days and uh, developments of automation started with these though, for example, Legend on by, by the Carragher and the, uh, and the Potter groups at, at Scripps, for example. But CCD and film uh, were still both not uh, such good detectors. Film was the best one, but, and this is now DQE, think of it kind of 
how much of the signal, the fraction of the signal that I keep or that I keep in the detection process of the um, of the electrons. It's typically expressed as a function of of the frequency, which kind of makes it counterintuitive. But you know, for film, you would you what, kind of one out of three electrons, if you would like to say would get detected uh, correctly uh, uh, up to about half Nyquist and then it would if by the time you get to Nyquist so your highest resolution you would only detect one out of ten electrons correctly if you would like to say so and then th in, in, in green red and blue were the same curves for three commercially available detectors by kind of 2013 we got prototypes in around 2012 of the of the Falcon 2 uh, by Thermo Fisher and, and it was Richard very much much involved in development and collaboration with Thermo Fisher. But for example, here in the US, David Agard worked with, with the Gatan company and they did the uh, K2 uh, detector, which uh, counted individual electron events, having quite a big effect at the lowest resolutions. And then at the higher ones, it was kind of a question which one was better. But suddenly we went from being able to detect one out of three electrons to at least uh, uh, half of all the electrons and, and at the lowest resolution even better than that for, uh, using the uh, the counting detectors. So that meant that signal to noise ratios in the individual image had a big jump, uh, big, big jump forward. And on the other hand was the introduction of uh, better image uh, processing methods and I'll, I'll discuss some of those in a bit. So I kind of like to explain you know, the effect of, of detectors and kind of what, we, what you could do with it with images of uh, these two uh, my favorite particles when they were still a lot smaller than they, were, than they are nowadays. So this picture was taken on a very rare bright sunny day in uh, Cambridge, England and um, uh, taking pictures of molecules in the electron microscope is, is very much unlike this because I've told you, you know, molecules are extremely sensitive to the to the uh, radiation that we use to image them. And in order to prevent them kind of burning away, we have to image under low dose conditions. So that would be the same as taking a picture of, of Jan and Matt under a uh, very uh, low light conditions, right? So signal to noise uh, kind of goes down uh, tremendously and we get these very grainy uh, pictures. But what happens in the microscope is even even worse than this. And uh, what happens in the microscope actually, uh, oh sorry, then for example just using a better detector where the camera is, is slightly more sensitive is a bit like, you know, using your perhaps your uh, old uh, CCD like first, you know, how you got these first digital cameras, they were pretty poor detectors, but now your iPhone has a beautiful uh, CMOS detector which is very sensitive and taking pictures at night isn't actually that hard anymore. And you know, you could you could take a better picture where you could better see the images, the particles, sorry. But what really happens inside the microscope is more uh, like, like this. And to explain that better, I'll switch the light back on so we can see what happens. So, um, when the electrons start to hit the particles and you get radiolysis or so lots of chemical bonds get broken and uh, in, the, in the protein and in, in the solvent around it and probably you know things like local formation of little gas bubbles etc what happens inside the sample is that motion starts to occur this is the kind of by now famous beam induced motion which happens as a consequence of radiation damage all the particles start to move and then we're taking pictures of moving objects which necessarily get blurred. So much like your iPhone can now be put in burst mode uh, and you can, we, also these direct electron detectors came with functionality to write out uh, very fast frames so we could record movies rather than individual um, uh, long exposure frames. So rather than taking one picture like this, you could then take multiple uh, sharper pictures uh, which kind of sampled uh, the motion and how that looks for like uh, now is it the slow quicker yeah how does that then look for uh, for our ribosome image so I'm just taking out one of these ribosomes this is the the average over a, a, a movie consisting of 16 frames actually and these are the individual movie frames now they're even even worse images than than the average because the dose that I put into the average images is now spread over 16 individual individual frames so the signal to noise of 
each of those is even lower. But somewhere hidden in these 16 noisy uh, movie frames is a ribosome particle that is moving as I took uh, that, uh, that uh, little movie in, in burst mode. So there is the potential now, if I could align the ribosomes, uh, individual particles in these 16 movie frames all on top of each other to undo some of the motion and make a, a much sharper image, which then will lead to a higher resolution reconstruction. So uh, that's what we uh, implemented, and uh, um, what we then what we saw, and, and others, for example, uh, uh, Nico Grigoriev, and I think Tim was involved in some of the early work as well, had already seen that you know some pictures that we took in the microscope were actually very good, and some other pictures were very bad, and we didn't really understand uh, why that was. And, and pr there's been some progress made, but still, uh, it's not uh, completely clear. So here I uh, include two of the images that my postdoc Xiao Chen Bao, uh, Xiao Chen Bai recorded. He's now at UT Southwestern in Dallas, and he was very proud of this image because you know you can actually see the ribosomes quite well there's all kind of little details he said you know that's a Xiao Chen Bai image which he would be proud of and then I was quite keen to also put in the paper an image that Xiao Chen was not so proud of because you know here you can see the the, the ribosomes are quite quite harder to see the image is more fuzzy and in in uh, with little red and green circles connected with, with white lines are the motions of individual particles of the ribosome uh, that we, we were able to detect and uh, correct for uh, exaggerated by, I think it's a factor of 25, so otherwise you, know, you wouldn't be able to see it, so the motions aren't as big on the real image there, 25 times um, exaggerated. But you can see that the, on this image, which Xiao Chen didn't really like, the motions were much larger than on the left image. This is such a good image because somehow Xiao Chen managed to take a picture where the sample was not moving. And uh, this one, they're moving around uh, quite a bit more, leading to blurring and, and resolution loss. So in the early days, if you would collect only individual images, you could still get potentially high resolution images. You just have to throw away all the bad images and just keep the good images, but that would be kind of uh, wasteful. By being able to now follow motion, we can, we can get back the sharp images by, by realigning the, the ribosomes as they move around. Another perhaps a surprising observation is that here the particles move from, le from green to red, from, from left to right, whereas at the bottom here they, they move in the other the way around, as if they're kind of rotating around some point in the middle or so, where there's nothing really special to see, at least we don't really understand why that is. So uh, being able to correct for it kind of saves this image, but you know, ultimately what's going on exactly inside, we don't really know, but also being able to monitor this now, we had a tool to actually see when it happens, and this then became the basis for all kind of developments to develop experimental grid supports, for example, by Chris Russo, a colleague of mine at the LMB, to try and stop these motions by making more stable supports where all your images look like that, and being able to follow what you're doing experimentally by, by looking at these motions movies was an important uh, tool that he needed to be able to do that. Cool. So that's one part of the uh, better image processing. Rather than having the still images with bl blurry uh, particles, we could make movies and then realign them and then, uh, then average them. Now, uh, all of that we did in, a, in our own software package, Relaun, which I mentioned uh, yesterday, and, and CJ just mentioned again uh, today. And um, you, can, you can download it uh, from here. It's all open software, so you can go in my code. I'll, I'll come back uh, at the end of my talk to make a few more comments about open software. If you do follow me on Twitter, you'll see I'm quite passionate about this uh, topic. And if you find I rant about open software accelerate science, uh, then I hope by the end of the talk you understand a bit uh, why that is. Now, the introduction of Relaun was around the same time as the first prototypes of the direct electrons detectors became available, and that has kind of made it, you know, not entirely clear some, in some cases where 
the, where the advances came from, but uh, I thought I'd explain to you two fundamental aspects in which Relyon was different from the software that was available uh, back then. And one of them is this concept of maximum likelihood type refinement, or as the mathematicians call it, uh, marginalization. And marginalization comes from, from a concept which the mathematicians called we have these hidden parameters which kind of make it difficult to solve the problem, uh, but they're, they're not uh, not exact. They're not really part of the uh, observed data themselves. And in this case, these are these relative orientations of each of the individual particles. If Thermo Fisher would sell us a microscope for ten million dollars rather than seven million dollars, and each particle came with a little label, this is a top view and this is a side view, then I would be out of a job because you would just reconstruct it straight uh, away, right? But the orientation of the particles is not known. And we have to go through this projection matching cycle to be able to find them. And what I told you is that we're going to compare each experimental image with all of these uh, reference projections, and then I'm going to assign the best possible orientation to each of the particles and do this three-dimensional reconstruction. Now, in Relaon, and also in software I wrote earlier in Madrid in XMIP, this co concept of maximum likelihood refinement, we do not only assign the best possible orientation to each particle, but we're going to use a statistical model of the data and of the noise, uh, of the signal and of the noise, to calculate uh, probabilities that it is a top view, a side view, etc. And, you know, if it looks a lot more than a top view than a side view, then the probability for the top view will be a lot higher than for the side view, but they're not necessarily 0% for the side view and 100% for the top view. So that's kind of the difference between all the methods that were available until then and first XMAP and then Relan was this concept of doing these, if you like, fuzzy orientational assignment based on a statistical model. But then the whole cyclical algorithm is still exactly the same, only that each particle will go in to the reconstruction in all possible orientations, but all weighted according to these probability weights. Sounds expensive, and, and, and it definitely is more expensive than doing the, it only in, in, in one orientation. So for that, we're going to need a statistical description of the, uh, of the images. We have to define a, a likelihood function. So I thought today I'll show you a little bit of math. I, I, went, uh, I did not discuss any yesterday. We're going to assume in Fourier space that the noise on each of the Fourier pixel is Gaussian and it's independent between different uh, pixels in Fourier space, which is probably not too bad a assumption. Uh, the, the Gaussianity of noise holds pretty well. Uh, through independence, we could have discussions over beer over, but I think overall it is a, a reasonable description. And because um, I could let the, the, the power of the, the, of the, sorry, the width of the Gaussian, so the kind of the power of the noise, I could vary that with spatial frequency in Fourier space. That gives me then the, the option to model uh, what is called uh, colored noise or pink noise or whatever. The noise doesn't need to be white, kind of, I can have, which means complete independence also in real space. I could let go of that. I can have a resolution dependent uh, model for the power of the noise. So I'll use sigma for that. Oh, that went too quick. So that, based on these assumptions, you can for each pixel j in Fourier space, you can you can make a Gaussian where this is the value of the Fourier pixel in the experimental image, and then the CTF has to do with this point back function, which I will uh, ignore, and then this is the projection of the three-dimensional volume in Fourier space that's just taking a two-dimensional slice out of that three-dimensional Fourier transform, and then the Gaussian is as wide as I think the 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 the, the amount of noise that I have in that in that spatial frequency. Cool. Now a second thing, and this is where then Relan was 
different at a fundamental level from my previous software that I wrote in, in Madrid is an explicit regularization as well. And uh, regularization is based on uh, the, the observation that the, the problem that we're trying to do is ill post. So there is so much noise in the experimental images that you could have an infinite amount of three-dimensional reconstructions, each of which is equally likely in the, in, uh, with, the, with the experimental data as evidence. And you can, you can kind of imagine that you know, the, there's all this very high resolution grainy noise in the experimental images that you could have many high resolution grainy reconstructions that are all kind of equally likely in terms of the data. And so if you, if you have an ill post problem, which as a mathematician what you would like to do is to regularize this, to include prior information such that together with the experimental data and the prior information there is only one unique solution. And uh, you can have a Bayesian view on this where you have a posterior, the probability of my model being the correct one giving the data is is a multiplication of the likelihood function, which is a probability of the data uh, being correct, giving uh, observed, be, giving the model, times the prior, the, the probability of the model itself being correct, uh, divided by the probability of, of taking the data in the first place. Now, the probability of taking the data is kind of more dependent nowadays on how many how many dollars you still have left on, on your grant, but once you've taken the data, it's kind of a given, so that kind of goes out and you, you, can, uh, you can just optimize what is called a regularized likelihood function, and that is what RELAM stands for, it's regularized likelihood optimization. So, um, where we multiply the likelihood function that I've just shown you, uh, marginalizing over all the angles, uh, all the orientations, by a prior on the model. Now the one million dollar question becomes, what information do I have about the model? It was p theta, p, the probability of the model, but x was not part of it. So what do I know about my reconstruction if I, haven't, if I don't take the data into account? And uh, let it please be something that I can uh, can optimize over nicely in, in a computer as well with some, some uh, nice algorithm. So um, what we came up with was, uh, well, this has been done in, 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 in parts of math mathematics already. So you can, if we assume that not only the noise in the in the images is Gaussian and independent, but also assume that this signal is Gaussian and independent. Now we kind of know the signal is definitely not independent in Fourier space because it lives on a limited domain in real space, so there, will, there have to be dependencies in Fourier space, but let's ignore those for now and assume that if the signal's Gaussian could be okay-ish and, and independent, then, uh, and we now have a, also a resolution dependent estimate of the power of the signal, uh, which I'll use a tau for, and if that falls with resolution, then what I'm actually saying that in real space my reconstruction needs to be smooth. So reconstructions of very, very rapidly changing white and black values, kind of very high resolution noisy maps are unlikely even if I haven't measured any data. That's the type of prior that goes in, but if you do it this way, you can just express it in a similar Gaussian function, you can then make this regularized likelihood function combining everything together, which gives this algorithm, and I won't go very much into the details of it, but it, it can estimate the, the resolution dependent power of the noise from the images themselves iteratively. It will estimate how much the power of the sigma is from the reconstruction that we do iteratively, and it combines these estimates into what is called an optimal filter in, in, in mass or, or a a Wiener filter, if you like, which uh, then accounts for the correction for all these uh, point spread function artifacts that I meant with the CTF, but also does the best possible three-dimensional low-pass filtered weighting of the reconstruction uh, uh, given the assumptions that I, I've told you about independent Gaussian signal and, and noise.
And the great thing, and that's what many of these Bayesian uh, type of algorithms have in common, there is no need for an expert user to tune all kind of buttons because this all gets estimated from the data themselves. So you have an algorithm which just learns by itself to do the best uh, possible filtering. And that became a very powerful tool because, you know, and then in 2014, 15, lots of people came flocking into the field who were not used to, to kind of tune all kind of parameters that existing programs needed to have and you had expert users tuning them because you had to keep overfitting and, and, and build up of noise in your reference at bay. Uh, Relyon kind of did that for you automatically. Now, that came at, at computational cost, and uh, rely on 1.0 uh, 1 to 1.4, you would basically need quite a big CPU cluster to run. You know, people would run it on 300, 400 CPU uh, type of nodes, and, and, you know, again, some of the CryM labs had that, but not, ma you know, many of the X-ray crystallographers flocking into the field definitely were not used to, to use high-performance computing systems. So it was really thanks to a collaboration with Eric Lindau, who's at the SciLive lab in Stockholm, and his two brilliant students, Björn Forsberg and Dari Kimanius, who's currently a postdoc in my lab, that they actually uh, took our code and did an implementation that used NVIDIA GPUs uh, based on, on the CUDA software to then do uh, all these calculations in a GPU accelerated uh, manner. And then, you know, times have gone down much further even, uh, even after that. Basically, we came to something where you could just use a desktop box more or less to do processing more or less in the time that you that it took you to take data back then now currently probably we're collecting data around 20 of 30 or so times faster than we did back then so perhaps it's uh, getting slightly uh, skewed again but uh, there was suddenly a whole jump in what you, the type of calculations you could do, and not only on high-performance computing software, but on computers that uh, you could just buy for $10,000 and set up in your lab. So what, what became possible with all of that? Uh, and one important thing that Relaun has traditionally been very good is, at is the separation of, of mixtures of structures into, uh, the, into, uh, in the, in, into subsets of particles of, of uh, the same structure. So many of the, of the protein complexes we study are molecular machines. So they m use relative motions of, of distinct parts of the machinery as an in, intrinsic part of their functioning so if you if you purify these complexes then very often in solution you they will have multiple of these functional states in, as, as a big mixture and then you know you end up with these images and you don't know which of the uh, particles is which now this concept of marginalization you can then extend to class assignments where I do projection matching not against one reference but against uh, a, a, give, a user specified number of references for example three and then uh, you can assign probabilities that each particle belongs to this orientation to this class and that orientation to that class and and do again probability weighted reconstructions but now three at a time and you can show that that then uh, uh, tends to converge to solutions where all the particles from the same structure end up hopefully in the same class and you can then do three reconstructions that simultaneously from the mixed uh, data Set. And this is just an example just for, for uh, ATP uh, synthase kind of thing which rotates around and you can then separate out these three different rotational states from mixtures of the images. <coughs> Now, of course, many of the of the protein complexes are not described by this type of heterogeneity where you have a, a user-specified number of discrete classes, and many complexes have a much more kind of flexible way of, of well, you know, where one domain flexes relative to another domain and or, or multiple ones. And to be able to describe those, we then introduce a, a algorithm called a multi-body refinement. And this is an example from a, a spliceosome uh, particle. And uh, just a 
reconstruction from a whole data set of, of a few hundred thousand of splice zone particles gave this map where the core region has pretty good details and the foot is kind of okay too, but the helicase is, is getting rather uh, rough here and, and most of the density of the of this factor SF3b is, is, uh, is absent or kind of very low uh, thresholds and that is because the, the SF3b, the helicase, they move independently from each other often with respect to the core and even the foot kind of wobbles around a bit with respect to the core. So you could now do 3D classification in a th discrete number of states, but if the foot moves left and the arm moves right for one particle, you know, this movement can be completely independent from, from this movement. So you, end, you quickly end up with an explosion of the number of classes that you would need to be able to describe each of them. So to be able to deal with that, we introduced multi-body refinement. And what, you do, what the user does, the user provides based on, on their expertise of the system, and this is where now user uh, control comes into play. Masks, which are indicated here with these, with these, uh, these colored outlines, of the do individual domains that the user assumes are now moving as individual rigid bodies relative to each other. And that's an assumption that needs to hold for your complex in order for this uh, method to work. If that's not the case, if they're not rigid bo body movements, then multi-body refinement will not work very well. But doing this for this uh, spliceosome, so we have masks around the, the core and the foot and the helicase and the uh, SF3B domain. Uh, these are just slices through the 3D reconstructions, and at the top is the consensus map. So you can see the the core was okay, but here at the at the top, the the helicase and the SS3B domains were rather uh, fuzzy. But now by masking out these individual domains and have an iterative method that that subtracts the other domains and ref tries to refine only the relative orientation of each of these four domains, you can get densities for each four of these domains, which look better than in the consensus map. The difference for the core is not very big because that was kind of stable anyway, but the foot does get better and especially the helicase domain here and to the largest extent the, this SF3B factor gets a lot better. This would be impossible to, to build any model in, but this uh, now gets to a resolution where uh, if you kind of have a crystal structure I think was available of individual parts, then docking those in would be, uh, would be quite, give you quite good model. I moved too far away from the... Uh, okay, so this is just a quantification of how much uh, better the map uh, then becomes. So you go from very low local resolution estimates to pretty good ones, and this, these are the FSC curves. <coughs> cool. Now, not only can you make the, the density of the individual domains better, also for each particle, you now have not just one orientation with respect to the consensus model, but you have four orientations, one for each of the individual bodies that you have uh, have refined uh, more or less independently. So you now have particles where the foot is, is, is up and the arm is to the left and you have particles. So what you can do is you can do a principal component analysis just on these orientations to see what is kind of the most abundant types of motions that are present in these complexes. And uh, you can then make uh, movies where you take now these better reconstructed constructed densities of the individual domains and move them along these uh, uh, principal components and then you can get, get kind of these kind of uh, movies where the biologist can say oh this I like this type of movement and you know I think this means whatever and then I can only sit and listen and uh, but for example the, the the helicase domain and the SF3B domain in this principal component which is the second one kind of move together so these domains do tend to move together They're there's another component where they move independently and both things happen in the data. But this is a way of visualizing what kind of motions are present in these, uh, in these big complexes. 
Cool. How, how are we doing for time? Yeah, I have to hurry up. But yeah. Cool. So uh, then in 2020, we uh, start, We collaborated with uh, Abhay Kutesha, who's at the uh, Thermo Fisher factory in Eindhoven. And they made, at Thermo Fisher, made some new hardware. And I think uh, you already have some of it uh, here. So uh, they did a, a cold field emission gun. I'll come back to that in a second. A new, more stable um, energy filter. I'll show you some data of that as well. And the next generation of the direct electron detector, the Falcon uh, 4, with even better DQEs and, and faster frame rates, etc. So uh, we uh, worked with Ape, we sent him some samples, apopharatin and, and the GABA receptor, and then uh, Takanori Nakana, postdoc in my lab, processed all the uh, movies that came off from this microscope. Now, one thing I haven't told you about yet is that our uh, electron microscopes, the objective lens, is actually uh, not that good if you compare it to a optical microscope, and it suffers quite badly from chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration also happens in optical, uh, micro in optical microscopy or any just normal light lenses. It means that light of different wavelengths get focused in different points. So, for example, here the the, the that light gets focused further away than the and then the blue light. So rather than have a beautiful picture of a, of a building, this one would be taken with aber aberration corrected uh, aberration chromatic a lens with aberration chroma chromatic aberration. Sorry. Uh, so the same happens in the microscope. It means that electrons, which are slightly higher energy, will be focused at a different point than electrons that are generated with a slightly lower energy. Now that would wouldn't matter if the energy source that we had, the field emission gun that generates the electrons, would make uh, only one wavelength, like a laser type of electrons, but that's not the type of sources that we have. And what's, what was present in all the cry and still is in all the cryances we have at the LMB is called an XFAG, and there is an energy spread. It's not that big, actually, if you think about it. It's 0.7 electron volts over the, you know, that compared to the 300,000 electron volts that, that is generated is still, you know, that's, that's very narrow. But uh, the chromatic aberration of the objective lens combined with this spread leads to an, an envelope uh, you so a kind of a, a how much signal still survives as a function of spatial uh, frequency that looks like here in blue meaning that at one angstrom's resolution if I have an XFAC just a chromatic aberration of the objective lens means that of the original signal I have less than 10% left now, the cold fag is a different way. It, it operates at much uh, colder temperatures than the XFAC, and they managed to reduce the energy spread of the beam to 0.3 electron volts, and that then gives a, 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 an envelope on the CTF which looks like this. So even at one angstrom, still more than 60% of the, of the signal is still there. So chromatic aberration of the objective lens becomes much less important. And together with that, a, a, a filter that filters away in elastic scattered electrons, much more stable than the uh, filters available until then. Over many days you get just a few EV uh, movement of the of the slits and that means you can make a much narrower slit and do this filtering away with inelastically scattered electrons better. And all this combined with then the software, which I already briefly referred to yesterday, uh, an important part here was this, this optical aberration correction. You still, if the scope isn't perfectly aligned and if we now want to push towards that one angstrom regime, then even very small errors in, in the alignment of the microscope can completely kill the signal. So there's lots of effects that go to the square of the cube with, with uh, the spatial frequency, so they become ever worse. And Jasenki wrote this software to be able to detect uh, asymmetric and symmetrical aberrations, basically phase shift, resolution dependent, or positional in Fourier space dependent shifts of the uh, Fourier component in the images, you can measure this and then reshift them back at ho uh, post hoc and kind of correct the optical aberrations that were present in your data uh, in the image processing. And all those combined then led to a, a reconstruction of, of apopharatin to uh, 1.2 uh, angstrom's resolution on data that were collected in, in I think a day and a half on, on one of these uh, prototype microscopes. And at 1.2 angstrom's resolution, you know, that's about the 
distance, the shortest distance between atoms, heavy atoms in a protein molecule. So you can see individual blobs of, of reconstructed density for almost all the atoms, heavy atoms in the, uh, in the apoferritin structure. And hydrogens are, of course, much uh, lighter than the, uh, than the uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms. But what we found, and this was worked together with Garib Murshidov, and they now have software in ServoCat, you can do this easily. If you build an atomic model that just consists of the heavy atoms, you can do a difference map, much like the X-ray crystallographers have done most of their lives, and you can then visualize beautiful difference peaks for the hydrogen atoms as well. And I think, you know, you could say, oh, why do I need to see an individual blob of density for each atom? Because I know a phenylalanine structure, so it, I, I only need two and a half angstrom's resolution, that's fine. But being able to visualize individual hydrogen atoms then makes it possible to visualize hydrogen bonding networks, which if you do perhaps drug design and so on, then these could be in, extremely important. And we were especially, this is my favorite part, of the whole reconstruction, we, I was especially pleased we could see H2O here. So this is, uh, this is one molecule of water with two uh, hydrogen sticking off the side of it. Now, uh, we also put on some samples from Radu Arichesco at Neurobiology uh, Division at the LMB uh, of the GABA-A receptor, a homopentameric kind of model system. That then went all the way to 1.7 angstrom. You can see beautiful density for ligands and some sugars here. And even at 1.7 angstroms, we think you can see uh, hydrogen atoms in different maps. And you can see here this beautiful beta sheet with, all, with loads of the hydrogens uh, being uh, shown in the difference map. Cool. Before I wrap up, uh, uh, just quick words on some trends in the field. Machine learning is picking up, so deep convolutional neural networks, you know, the whole a thing that the only, not only has an impact on, on alpha fold uh, structure prediction, also in our field, so picking heterogeneity, Alan Zong, uh, cryo dragon, etc. And there's lots of other things coming up. So in this in this light, I think it's really really useful if you could all submit your data sets to the Empire data sets, not only your PDB models in your EMDB reconstruction, but just the raw movies, so that people like us can download them and train big neural networks and make your life even easier in the future. Uh, automation throughput on the fly processing. I understand some of it already going on here as well. Lots of different solutions. And uh, there is a kind of a shift. A lot of the excitement is now moving from single particle analysis to tomography, subtomogram averaging, and a lot of progress is being made there. And it's great to see you have your national facility of electron tomography here uh, already uh, in uh, Madison. I promise you a few comments on open software. Relan did not come out of the blue. I did the postdoc with uh, Jose Maria Carrazo, where I learned to program for CryoEM. We did all our work in XMIP, and Relan relied heavily on code written in XMIP. Jose Maria did his postdoc with Joachim Frank, got lots of input from Spider, so XMIP has inputs, has kind of a lot of influence from Spider, etc. You know, I think uh, Relan used code from BSoft, all kind of libraries. From, from Bernard Hyman. I didn't use code from FreeAlign, but I did use some of the, of the concepts and, and Fourier space reconstruction, etc. So I was definitely influenced a lot by the code of FreeAlign. And uh, for me, it was satisfying to see that, you know, by keeping uh, our s software open source, which is what all these packages have in common, also Reliant then led to a new program in, in China by Xuming Li, I think, at Thunder. And, and hopefully, because Thunder is open source, other people can and build on that. So uh, and then, you know, it's it's great to also to see Freeline was, of course, made by Richard Henderson and then Nico Grigoriev. And then uh, now there's kind of, again, another line in, in the tree of, uh, of the fam family tree of Cryam uh, uh, software with system. And, and, um, and it's great. You guys have been able to attract Tim here because having the ability to do software development in-house, you know, that makes you so much more flexible if new problems come up to, to be able to uh, respond and have more flexible things than the just standard out of the box solutions available. So open software sharing all these ideas I think has underlaid much of the rapid progress that the field has made in the past decades. Uh, so free flow of ideas used to, uh, leads to efficient scientific progress and that kind of opposes then closed source software and in the field there's two examples. iMagic was kind of in the times the same as Spider and then because it's closed source not, nothing develops further on it. 
and uh, now recently also CryoSpark commercial software. And I, I probably it's fair to say that CryoSpark was heavily influenced by Relyon. It uses our regularized likelihood function, used on different uh, optimization function, perhaps but, uh, uh, optimization algorithm. But the the target is exactly the same as we introduced for Relyon, and they they had a very look, good look at our GPU acceleration code, which helped them make it uh, faster too. So, but again, this is closed source, so further developments are, are more difficult. So commercialization, you know, what you can do as a software developer there, you can have restrictive licenses and many academics do that too. Uh, you can keep your source even closed and that also happens in academia, you know, that's, that prevents people from building on your software. Um, and, but I think a recently new thing is patents. Um, for cryam image processing, that is new and uh, that's only done in companies so far. Uh, it's very familiar concept for technological developments, but I think for mathematical concepts, for algorithms, it's kind of relatively new also being able to patent algorithms, but that's what you can do now, and that starts to hurt because, you know, we do, that's algorithm development is what we do, and now there's lawyers telling us we can't do certain things. So there's lawyers telling me I have to take parts out of Relan, which is uh, not so good. So commercialization is not always a bad thing. I don't want to rant too much about it, and perhaps it's the way the world works. It may even allow for more money into software development for CryoM, which makes for very nice click to click GUIs and, and being able to accelerate software a lot more because they can hire engineers that, that, I, that we can't, for example. And, but ultimately, I think the community thrives on diversity of software, so a mix of commercial and academic is a good thing too. But I think the scientific progress should be uh, protected and, and patents I see as a threat there because in the end, I don't want power of what academics can do in their research in, to be in the hands of lawyers. And I feel we're, we're, we're at the danger of sliding in that direction. So that brings me to my conclusion slides. So let's keep it happy. Uh, new detectors and software revolution. Uh, I think, you know, being able to do different stru multiple structures from mixtures is really a key advan uh, advantage of CryoEM. It will have great, you know, going in the future, you know, I think we can push that much further, flexible type of heterogeneity separation, learn about protein dynamics, uh, achieve up to atomic resolution is now possible for apoferritin, but we all work on things which are much more interesting than apoferritin. How far can we push that? Uh, and then ultimately, I think we do have to think about protecting scientific progress, and funders as well as users both have a role to play. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Charles, for giving us such an informative uh, lecture. So don't rush to queue up in front of our Creos yet. Uh, we have questions for um, Charles. Anyone has any questions? Aaron. So wonderful lecture. Um, I, I would say there may be some lawyers at Wharf on campus whose ears like a cop fire during that last part, but um, the, the question I had has to do with the noise modeling, and I, I'm a little bit naive on, on cryo-EM, and, and so do you guys use EMCCDs or CMOS cameras? And I'm, I'm kind of wondering what the future is there, because on, on the type of imaging I do, um, people traditionally use EMCCDs, but the noise modeling is completely different for a CMOS camera, and so that's kind of led to um, some division in the software because you can't use some software with some cameras and, and vice right. versa. Yeah, so as you go down in, in exposure, you know, you no longer will have Gaussian distributions, you'll get to real Poissonian distributions from, from real counting statistics. So if you go in, in the very low dose ranges per image frame, which probably with some of the new detectors, you definitely are in those regimes, then Gaussian models might not be the best, but Poissonian models are extremely difficult to handle computationally. So I think probably that's not where our main limitations will lie for, for quite a long time, because by adding multiple frames together quickly, multiple Poissonians together become very much like a Gaussian. So the kind of detectors influence on the mo noise models, I think I'm not too worried about at this point. In the do they use EMCCDs or are they using CMOS? They're CMOS type detectors, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, I, I'm sort of interested in the, your 1.2 angstrom structure. 
Uh, why do you think you didn't get better than 1.2 angstroms? Do you think it is the microscope, the apoferritin, or the, the processing? Oh, I think we're probably quite limited by particle numbers. So for example, Dmitry Tegernov presented a one angstrom structure at the Gordon conference last uh, autumn. And he had two data sets to play with. One was ours. Uh, and then Holger Stark used a different type of microscope with a new kind of CS type corrector and a, and a, and a monochromator, which is kind of hardware wise a lot more difficult perhaps to handle, but what he did do, he imaged for many, many, many days at the microscope and got a way bigger data set. And he then published a, a, a resolution which was slightly lower than ours. But Dimitri, of course, made a very good choice by looking at that data set because there was a lot more raw data and probably Holger didn't push, you know, Takanori is the absolute king of squeezing the most out of the data. So, um, and Holger, I think, did not do that. So Dimitri probably just squeezed that data set pretty well dry. So, but to answer your question, is so amount of particles probably plays a role. Uh, our B factor is quite good. So I, I don't think apoferritin in itself, the structure is, is very much limiting. It's quite, quite a good rock at that, uh, in that aspect. Um, anyone else has uh, questions for Charles? <clears throat> Hello. Um, well, this is amazing. In 1981, I saw a talk in Heidelberg with uh, Jacques Dubochet, and uh -huh. there's quite a lot of progress. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm not in the field, but I remember talks about handiness, you know, like right hand, left hand. I is that not an issue anymore? Oh, it is. So yeah. from a... 2D projection image, just like if you stick your hand in the x-ray generator in the hospital, from the x-ray image you will not be able to see whether it's your left or your right hand, right? Because you can just flip the image yeah. around. So you can reconstruct your molecule in, in either way, in the left or the right-handed uh, form, and, that, and both of them are equally likely in, in light of the data, until you go to very high resolution and then uh, small effects, uh, evil sphere curvature start to play up. But what happens normally is you solve it in one hand, and then you realize that all your alpha helices go the wrong way, or, and then you just flip the whole thing around. Right, but that you. you can't do if you're too low resolution. So if you're at eight or nine angstroms, you might be having your structure in the wrong hand, and then you'll need kind of external data to, to, to make sure you're in the right hand. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Hey, I had a question. You mentioned a couple, you mentioned two instances where you had um, human input model parameters for the number of classes in a mixed structure that you're trying to pull out, and then the number of um, positionally independent modules of a single structure. I was wondering if you had explored um, automated algorithms for model selection on a either or a mixture of the two of those input parameters. Right. Yeah. So. What happens in, the, the short answer is not really. So what happens in practice is that you use, we like to use quite a few more classes than we think there are different structures. And then quite a few of them will go and become quite small with some particles that don't like to be with the rest because they're, they're probably not so good particles. And then it's still the user kind of has to interpret the three-dimensional reconstructions of the more populated classes to see what they mean. And perhaps some of them are, are actually the same structure should be combined, for example, or, or, or they're really distinct states. For 2D class averaging, and I haven't really spoken about it. We did now do some automated selection of 2D class averaging, which is often used to, as an initial uh, uh, analysis tool to see how good the data is and to select the very best particles uh, out of the data set. So there we've, we've done automated procedures also based on, on convolutional neural networks trained on big data sets that we've collected over the past few years to, to aid the novice user to make those type of decisions or to be part of a completely fully automated pipeline. But those do not yet exist for 3D, so there we still have 
users kind of interpreting what's going on. Thanks. Um, if I get a, oh, oh. do you have a second question? Yeah. Okay. A, a quick second question. Sorry. Um, in you, you talked about reconstructing um, vectors of motion in the molecules, and you described it as a principal component analysis, where you're taking out. Um, components of the positional information. Um, when you're doing a principal component analysis, in its most simplest form, some of those vectors aren't necessarily all occupied at the same time. Like you can have the data can be correlated in where it is along that. Yes. Is that an issue that you? Uh, oh, so that's what we visualize in our analysis software. So you can look at how all the particles are distributed along each of those components. You can then even decide, you know, if that's not a monomodal, monomodal distribution, but if, for example, a bimodal, then that would be an indication there's really discrete kind of heterogeneity happening, and you can then separate your particles based on, on the eigenvalue in that, for that uh, eigenvector. Thanks. Right, I think so. We have one um, one more final question from the online audience. So I'm going to speak for John In. Uh, he's asking how can we relate um, PCA motions that you showed earlier to, for example, to compare it to molecular dynamics um, stimulation. So how would you um, compare that to you know um, modeling as compared to PCA motions? Um, these are kind of representations of what the distribution of all the particles in the data set look like. Now that probably means that you know the an individual particle could pass through those motions that's perhaps not entirely guaranteed but that's what I think one would would think to happen so you know currently it would be quite I think they, they're a bit apart so you have these motions which happen in your cryam sample and, and you have some some predictions made by molecular dynamic simulations what I hope will happen in the in the next five to ten years is that the analysis tools to look at protein dynamics by cryam because it it is a single imaging, single molecule imaging technique, although the individual images are very noisy, it is single molecule imaging. So there is information about a lot of different conformational states. And what I hope is with better analysis tools, and then combined with deep learning methods, you know, AlphaFold 2, etc. deep convolutional networks are now very good at predicting protein structure. They're probably not very good at understanding the dynamics of protein structure because they haven't had any data to train on. But perhaps cryoam in the next decade can provide a wealth of data of much finer grained individual states of protein molecules and we can then train deep convolutional neural network to actually predict what happens if I have a protein structure, you know, if I perturb this in some way, how will it react? You know, I bind something, what will happen? Currently, that's only the realm of experimental structural biology. But one would hope that at some point you gain enough data and understanding, hopefully, to, to be able to do that also in a computer. And then we can all go on a long holiday. Thank you, Charles. Uh, everyone give uh, Charles a round of applause. Thank you.